Now being recorded. I'm on vacation next week and I want to get this form to you that you wrote for Well, yeah. good afternoon. This is Kimberly Hambrick. It is now 2 o'clock and I want to get our webinar started. I want to do a few housekeeping items in that um, we did try to mute all the participants' lines, but we had an issue with one of our presenters not being able to speak. So I would like to ask all the participants to please mute their phone lines, either mute it by your button on your phone or do star six, which works with the system. I thank yeah. you so much for understanding why we'd like to have all the phone lines muted and keep some of the distractions um, at a minimum. Today is the 25th or 6th. Can I make a copy of I'm going to make copies of both of these. Thank you. Okay, so you probably want to take a note. So again, this is Kimberly Hambrick, and I, I thank you again for muting your phone lines. I want to welcome you all to the simulated workplace, changing CTE in West Virginia. I'm the Associate Director of the Appalachia Regional Comprehensive Center, and we're putting this webinar on in partnership with uh, my colleague from the National Association of State Directors of Career, uh, Career Technical Education. I'll, I'll introduce her better here in a second. I apologize, something popped up on my screen. Before we get started, I do want to follow a few housekeeping idea, items. As I said, we would like for you all to mute your phone lines so we can keep the distractions down. Thanks have a, up on your top, you'll see a note box, which is how you can connect to Adobe if you have connection issues. You've heard that the webinar is being recorded, so it will be archived and available later. And we do have a chat box. If you see uh, about midway down, thank you, there's an attendee chat. That's where we'd like for you to ask your questions. We do have a time at the end for questions and answers. We may not get to all of them during our presentation, but we will be archiving the questions, having our presenters answer them, and we will follow up and share those afterwards. So again, please mute your phone line. Oh, yeah, because they don't want to get that heat. Yeah. Some of you will probably have a few questions about where you can find information from the PowerPoint and the webinar recording. And so we do have two websites here where you can get it afterwards. And if you're interested in learning more about the simulated workplace, also a link to that as well. And these will also be included in the follow-up material so you have them. Before we do get started, we wanted to take a quick poll to find out where our webinar participants are from. So if you wouldn't mind, if you would please look at the poll that's on the screen, which of the following best describes you, and just quickly let us know who represents you. Yeah. I noticed yeah. Judy and them still go at 10. You and Lily are walking outside, and Lily's coming back. And again, please mute your phone lines. Okay, great. Um, so, just by quickly looking, we have 23% um, of the audience from the state education agency staff, 
and 17% are other, and we also have state education agency leaders. Thank you. That just helps us know a little bit more about who is in the audience. So as I said earlier, my name is Kimberly Hambrick, and I'm the ARC Associate Director. The ARC is the Appalachia Regional Comprehensive Center, and we are one of 16 regional centers. Our mission is to design initiatives in partnership with our four states, Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, and West Virginia. And those initiatives will improve educational outcomes for students, close the achievement gaps, and enhance instructional quality. One of the key areas that we focus on is implementing college and career ready standards and aligned high quality assessments for all students. And that really is the key area that we're focusing the webinar on today. Today marks the launch of our webinar series on CTE in partnership with National Association of State Directors of Career Technical Education Consortium. And at this time I'd like to introduce my co-partner, Andrea Zimmerman, who is a State Policy Associate Consortium. Thanks, Kimberly. And uh, here at NASCA CTEC, we are um, happy to be joining with ARC for this webinar series. Um, it gives us an opportunity to really take a look at um, some high-quality examples of CTE in the state. Um, so a little bit about um, NASCA CTEC and um, you know, who we are, but we represent the state-level leaders who oversee the CTE programs and policies impacting secondary, post-secondary education in the workforce. And that includes folks like Kathy D'Antoni, the West Virginia State CTE Director, who will be presenting today. Um, and it's really thanks to Kathy that we've been watching the simulated workplaces grow and evolve over the last few years. And in fact, in 2014, we awarded one of um, our inaugural Excellence in Action Awards to uh, the carpentry program at Tulsa High School in Fort Gay, West Virginia, which is a simulated workplace site. And now these awards are designed to lift up high quality, high impact programs of study, and our panel of judges, when looking at the application, really saw how the simulated workplace at Tulsa exemplified exactly that. And in particular, um, through its integrated academic and technical courses and innovative work-based learning method. And so it's with that that I'd like to hand it off to Kathy um, to introduce the rest of today's <coughs> presenters. Kathy? Good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon, Andrea. Um, we're tickled to death to be here. The presenters with me today are Jan Hanlon, who is a secondary curriculum director in one of our county school systems, Doug Sands, who is a CTE instructor in United Technical Center, Gary Clay, who is a business leader who is with the West Virginia Manufacturing Association and played a huge role in the development of simulated workplace, and Austin Coffey, he is a student uh, that has been in the simulated workplace for a year now, and we're tickled to death to have him so he can share his experiences. Simulated workplace was created because of the situation that was happening um, across West Virginia. Over the past five to ten years, I have listened to business and industry at meetings, at conferences, and the message went from, um, you know, these are the skill sets we need for quality employees, and over the end, oh, by the way, you know, they need to show up for work. Well, that changed dramatically up until last year that employers were almost shouting at us that, just send me somebody that's drug free can show up, do a full day's work, we'll train them. And that was the message. And I'm thinking, you know, what's going on? We have Skills USA winners, we have outstanding students, CTE students that are graduating. What's what's happening here? So one of the things that we figured out was the the change is students understanding the business processes. We deliver great technical skill sets, but were we delivering 
the business processes that students can be successful when they take those skill sets into the workplace. So we decided to take some bold steps and move this forward. So we engaged business, and we also did higher ed folks, and we brought them in to talk about what if we changed the entire environment of our CTE classroom and had it actually working as a company would work. Now, it's not products that they make to sell outside the school building. This is actually operating and students understanding business processes and the fact that their attendance, the work that they do, the tests that they take actually impact a business's bottom line because it impacts their company's bottom line. And so with the business uh, folks, we identified 12 protocols that were absolutely mandatory in every one of the simulated workplace companies. We did that for a number of reasons. One, to make sure the structure was consistent across the state and that everybody was on the same level as we started to implement uh, these simulated workplace protocols. So our goals were that we didn't, we were going to change everything. We're changing the whole culture of career tech and in education. So we had to have time to get it implemented, and we knew that we couldn't just start statewide. So we set aside four years for our implementation process. And we began with pilots, and then we've moved every year. We started out with 80 sites. We are now up to 501 sites. By 2016, that's the way we will do business in West Virginia. Um, so when we first started, we had to get buy-in from our key stakeholders, and these were our business people, these were instructors, these were our students, these were everybody that was involved in the simulated workplace to make it happen, and we started with our pilots. So the whole purpose was to increase student leadership and engagement. CTE probably has more student engagement than any other classroom in education. However, it still wasn't to the level that we were looking for. We wanted our instructors to transition from actual uh, teacher-type driven instruction to facilitators of learning and allow students to manage and take over these companies as a teacher facilitated that and monitored their progress. It was a school-wide cultural change. And um, you will hear later from one of the instructors to see what the differences is, or were. <clears throat> we have been, this is probably the most important slide because people, when they hear simulated workplace, our instructors, our students, they get a different, they get their own perspective of what they think they, uh, this, this is. What it is, it's not a curriculum. It's an environment. It changes the way that we deliver career technical education. So it is not a curriculum. I can't stress that enough because when we were starting with, with instructors, we kept getting this question, well, I, I really like this, but when am I going to have time to teach it? So the whole idea is that this is an environment of which they enter. It's an opportunity for students to be accountable for their own learning because what they do in that classroom is directly impacts their company that they're in, their bottom line or their, their value. And their companies are evaluated based on attendance, based on test scores, based on um, drug testing, the whole nine yards are all go together to give this company a uh, value, a monetary value of which we'll get into later. It's an opportunity for, for teachers and instructors to be flexible and to be very engaging as they are in the actual workplace. They get an opportunity to facilitate learning that these students would see in an actual workplace. 
And it also requires high academics and high technical learning because that's where the, the better the students are, the, the more their company is valued. Okay, so. So we started engaging our stakeholders from the, from the start. We had to establish a climate for change. People had to know what was going on. We started with the Manufacturing Association. That's why Gary Clay, who's on the line, was such an integral part of this. So we started with that group. Most of all, we wanted feedback from our pilots, from our instructors, but most of all, our students. We wanted to know is this, do they like this? Is it more engaging? Do they feel it's worth doing? And I, uh, it's very interesting because you will see later our students are probably our biggest uh, supporters of simulated workplace. So let's get to, uh, like I said, this is in now in state policy in West Virginia. It's how we're going to be doing business. Um, it will be uh, mandatory in 2016. Kathy, this is Kimberly. I'm sorry, I advanced it too fast, and we, wanted, okay. to have, we wanted to have Gary talk. I apologize for that. Uh, I, okay. <coughs> I, I apologize. Okay, so we're going to go over to Gary. Okay, Gary. Would you All right, I got it. Okay. Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the engagement process that Kathy was talking about. Uh, it, it was several years ago that the West Virginia Manufacturers Association, which I represent, engaged Dr. D'Antoni to talk about what we needed from potential employees. And, and, the, and the easier part of that was sitting down talking about uh, technical. We created a great manufacturing pathway program with all the technical skills we were looking for, put that all together. But we also asked her for some soft skills. These are things that the, the, the students were missing. And those included a, a passion for safety, uh, good attendance records, and showing up on time. Uh, if you don't show up for school, what makes me believe that you're going to show up for, for work? Um, being drug and alcohol free, an attitude that this was not just a job but a career, a teamwork mentality. We find many students today who prefer to work by themselves but that's not the real world in, the, in our environment. Uh, we were also looking for a knowledge of improvement methodologies, process improvement methodologies, and a desire to understand how their efforts made a difference in the company and helped to improve and ensure their future. Uh, these skills were important to all career and technical students, no matter where they're going to work. It wasn't just manufacturing. This applies to all the students in technical education. And the simulated workplace is addressing all of these areas, and the students are truly engaged. So that, that's my part. Jan, do you want to talk about uh, the CTE school administrator engagement? Yes, I do, Kathy. Thank you. As a CTE administrator, what I needed to do to make sure that this change happened is I needed to inform, like, the CTE instructors of what simulated, simulated workplace was about. And I needed them to have buy-in and wanted and want to participate in simulated workplace. The next thing that I needed to do was to inform our local school board members and our county superintendent of simulated workplace. And I needed them to embrace the idea of drug testing CTE students with imperatives. I also needed to to reach out to our business leaders because I wanted them to be excited about the change that was about to happen. As Gary said, concentrating on those professional attitudes for children or for students. And I knew that if business and industry were to embrace this concept, that our students would be successful. OK. All right. So, like I said, this is in our policy now. This is how we're going to be doing business. And we established between uh, business folks and ourselves the 12 protocols that we would follow 
for simulated workplaces across the state of West Virginia. So I'm going to let uh, our folks talk about these protocols a little bit. Um, the reason that, uh, first of all, the reason we need the protocols, as said earlier, is so that we can standardize and make sure everybody's on the same page. So Jan, if you would like to talk about the first one, changing the tran traditional, traditional classroom into a company. Okay. Every simulated workplace instructor's classroom should look different. Each classroom should mimic that of each profession. The environment or the classroom should be courteous, self, safe, clean. It should be a place where expectations are clear and teamwork and leadership is definitely encouraged. Students are, are in charge of their learning and the instructor becomes the facilitator. Student-led projects are one of the main focuses of simulated workplace. We should provide a meeting or a conference area for students to meet and to set goals and to make certain that our students are on task. Also in the protocols, it gives attention to attendance, like Gary said. We wanted to have a method for students' attendance to be tracked. In our facility at Ralph R. Willis, we use a time clock. Yes. And, pardon me? And students, okay. whenever they come to class, they uh, punch their time clock or they lay their finger down to, um, to check into class to, uh, to track their attendance. And then the next protocol deals with drug testing. And, you know, we just basically wanted to provide a safe work environment, and we knew that if teens remain drug-free in those adolescent years, that data shows that they're more likely to remain drug-free during their professional career. And we wanted to deter students from drug use at all. We encourage students with a positive drug test to get counseling to overcome their substance abuse. Um, our local agency and county is responsible for developing the policy, how the drug tests are to be administered, and what services would be available if a student did have a positive drug test. In our county, if we do have a student with a positive drug test, we remove the student into, uh, until a licensed therapist or counselor can do a risk assessment and determine whether they, they are a recreational user or if there is indeed a, a substance abuse problem. And then once that's determined, the student will then take another drug test to enter back into the simulated workplace environment. I do want to say at no time do we suspend the student for a positive drug test because we want that learning to continue. And then protocol four on your slide deals with the application and the interview process. And I have to say that this is what really uh, created that buy-in for our instructors for us to go school-wide with the simulated work, uh, workplace environment. And our instructors, when they hire a workforce, they go to, um, to our three five schools and they interview students based on that application. Um, and then they, um, and it makes, it gives the students a way to make informed decisions about their future career goals. When a student is, is asked to fill out the application and to apply for a position in the company, it takes a commitment and, and a really, and thought to go through the process rather than just being dumped into a, to a CTE program. We do not deny any student's entry into a public funded CTE program unless that program is full and we take 20 students in each area. We use rubrics to interview the students and to judge or evaluate their application. On the application itself at Ralph R. Willis, we added an attendance component and a behavior component. So after they're admitted into their company, therefore we rarely have any attendance issues or behavior problems, and I would like to say that our quality of our students has increased at our center. 
Dan, this is Kimberly. We have a participant asking who pays for the drug testing. Um, I, we do. I mean, the, state, the state does. And is that through special uh, specific funds or a part of your – it was set up that way? It's set up. That's part of the uh, state dollars that go out. Uh, we send out grants to the local uh, counties. When I said this is the way we do business, we have revamped all of our vocational dollars to support the simulated workplace initiative. So we fill in where they have uh, – where counties cannot afford, we help with special grants. Thank you. And thank you, Jan. Doug, if you'd like to talk about Protocol 10. Sure. Thank you. Um, one of the areas that we needed to deal with uh, when we talked to uh, business and, and Gary and uh, different places like that was we had to really put a heavy emphasis and focus on safety um, and sustainability and repeatability were, were huge. Um, and we were able to move into this uh, 5S initiative, which uh, has become an industry standard. Uh, just about any shop or, or uh, workspace that you walk into today, um, this is a language that they're using on a regular basis. So when our students go out, they're already speaking an industry language. They already understand what it is to make that work environment safe, uh, but not only make it safe, but keep it safe and what it takes to sustain that. Uh, so this, uh, this protocol was applied in, in, in every workspace, uh, which has given us, again, that repeat repeatability and sustainability. Okay, this is uh, Gary. I'm going to talk about uh, protocols 11 and, and 12, and, and really those are, are the business inspections and the portfolios. This is where the the local businesses get involved in the program. And, and the business inspections uh, were coming in and, and basically auditing uh, the programs. And, and these, this activity is so important uh, to go forward here, and I think on many levels. Uh, it, and it, it applies to everyone. For the instructors and the schools, uh, this outside validation uh, that they're teaching the right things, it's an opportunity for folks to come in and change or tweak things that aren't working or aren't correct uh, for today's environment. And for the students, it's a chance to interact with maybe some future employers, uh, a nice time to show their skills and promote themselves. And for the employers, probably most importantly, it's a chance you get in to, to go in and see how well these programs are working. You find out what great students there are. You, you actually go in and meet the students and see the, the passion that these kids have for their programs. It's also a chance to correct some of the things and make sure these programs are going to provide the skill sets and the, and the soft skills that you're looking for. And now for the employer, you feel connected to the program, invested in the program, because you've put your seal of approval on it. So a very important process, we believe. And the second thing, and we're really excited about the portfolio program uh, that's going on here. Many employers tell us they can't trust the high school diploma anymore. It doesn't mean that these uh, students have 12th grade skills. Well, the portfolio shows what the student has accomplished. It includes their attendance records and whether they're on time for classes. It's a documented drug test. It's certifications of the skill accomplishments they've had, whether that be welding or any of those programs. Those certificates are in there. And there's examples of the projects and things that they've worked on. Uh, it's much like an artist portfolio. Here are the things I can do, and here's examples of what I've accomplished. When I talk to hiring managers, and tell them what these portfolios are and what things are in there, what manager wouldn't want to see an employee show up with a portfolio of all his skills and abilities in one place. They actually are extremely excited, and this is a real positive thing from the program. So I'm going to pass it off to Austin now to talk about the, the student perspective. Uh, hey, I'm Austin. I'm, I'm a student at Wyoming County Career and Tech Center. Uh, I go to industrial equipment maintenance program. Uh, I'll be a senior next year. And what I would like to discuss is uh, our program, we go by as a company, because that's what you would see out in the real world. Our company name is Mountaineer Industrial Services. And we organized our program into four groups. We have a safety team group, 
uh, equipment, tools, and facility manager, inventory control and supply manager, and informational tech group. Uh, each group has a specific task that they have to do. The safety team, which I'm a part of, I'm the leader of it. We have weekly safety meetings on different subjects every week and each employee which is the student signs a paper to verify that they attended the meetings they understand you know the accidents and stuff like that and we keep records of the safety meetings and stuff to do with safety uh thing we're trying the safety team is developing is a hazard training form for visitors. It's a brief summary of hazards in our shop that we're familiar with, but they are not. Because we're more familiar with our shop than they are. One main safety that visitors have to do is wear safety glasses. That's mandatory in our shop. You do not step one foot in our shop unless you have safety glasses. Because if somebody's running any type of equipment, any anything can fling in your eye or hurt you or whatever. But uh, all I'm the safety team is going to come up with. Uh, like penalties, consequences, like if you do not follow safety regulations, they're going to come up with different consequences. But uh, now in the beginning, when we first started Simulated Workplace, I was a little bit sketchy of it. I didn't think it was going to go well, and I just... Didn't I thought it was going to be a waste of time, actually. But once we started getting into it and started rolling with it, you know, it gets a little bit aggravating at times, but and you got to make a little tweaks. I mean, you got to make it to where it fits you in your program. But once we started getting it rolling, it, it works really, really good. I mean, we've done it for a year now. It makes us more organized. It keeps, like, it helps people stay safe. Keeps different stuff clean, like the shop clean from anything like tripping hazards or anything like that. Uh, and also, I've learned of being a part of the safety team that it could be a lifetime career like all the groups that we have the four groups that we have all the other companies in a real life situation has similar groups so each group that you're a part of you can probably make a lifetime career out of it like each semester of the school year we switch groups We'll be in safety group one one semester or one nine weeks, and then we'll switch to the informational technology manager. Get a feel for each group. Uh, but once you get rolling with this thing, it smoothens out. It gets a little bit aggravated at times, but it'll line out. Uh, best Thank thing you. about simulated workplace is the program gives you a little bit of a leeway. Like, instead of them telling you, you got to do it like this, you can't change nothing, they're giving you a leeway to where you can make it to where it fits you. If you don't like something or, like, something don't feel right, you can make little tweaks to it. Uh, like, our company 
we took it upon ourselves to like change the names of our groups to for it to fit our company and our business like. But uh Austin, this is Kimberly. Thank you so much. For You're welcome. Giving the perspective of the students. <laughs> I see there there is a question. You know, we have some questions coming in and I'm trying to keep some of them until the end, but there was one that's a little bit relevant here. And the participant is asking how often the classroom businesses are reincarnated so all students get the experience and buy in. There that's the way we do business. It, what what are you asking? I mean, that's from now on, every CTE program someone enters, they're entering a business. They're not entering a CTE program. They're entering a company. Is, is that what you're asking? Is that? Yes, Kathy, I think that's exactly where, where they were getting at. Yeah, yeah it, it's, we are no longer a welding program. We are no longer an industrial maintenance program. Mm -hmm. Students apply and are interviewed to come into a welding company at their school. And uh, in some instances, we have seniors sitting on these, seniors that are in these uh, companies sitting on the interview process. Um, what Austin is referring to, the students have a huge say in how their company operates. They develop policy and procedure manuals. They determine their name. They set forth the various organizational structure. And they basically run their company, and the instructor becomes a facilitator. That is a huge cultural change. And um, we have, you know, it is what we're seeing, and I'll get in that in a minute, uh, is unbelievable. So I'm going to go into it. Getting ready to go into, which is the data piece of it, I guess. Uh, what we're seeing so far is that we, well, we do student surveys, we do instructor surveys. We're only, you have to understand, we're only in our second year. We haven't even scratched the surface of our vision of what the simulated workplace will look like in another six years. But so far, we have seen attendance rates go up. Discipline referrals have gone down. We have a 96% approval rate from student surveys that we're getting. The our business inspections that we're talking about, these business people go into these companies and inspect sort of like a health department inspects yeah. uh, a restaurant. They have given me feedback. From this feedback, we have uh, changed some curriculum. We have added pieces of equipment. Companies have given us equipment when they wanted a certain piece for their partic that partic particular program. Um, we have had students been hired because of these inspections because business people saw what they were doing when they came in. So those business inspections, the business people absolutely endorse this program. Um, so that that's basically we're very uh, early on in our data. We're hoping to see we're going to start comparing our achievement rates, our test scores. Uh, as we move forward. But at this point, most of our data is anecdotal. But that anecdotal data in, includes student focus groups. And I had a young, I've had, I've asked the question to students across this West Virginia in at least five different settings. And I said, why do you like simulated workplace? And without batting an eyelash, every single one of them in different situations looked at me and said, because we're respected. It, it absolutely floored me. The, these students have pushed the envelope of their companies, and they're doing things in their companies that instructors have told me that they never even thought of that these kids have moved forward with. So what I'm seeing and what we're hearing and what being activated in these classrooms, I would never go back to the traditional classroom. So the lessons learned uh, that we have done is, first of all, change doesn't happen real easily. <laughs> it doesn't happen quickly. 
That's why we started with the pilots. We have tweaked this based on our pilots a little bit when we tried to put it in. You have to be careful. When you try to put simulated workplace in, my suggestion would be that you pick protocols. You sort of look at what do I want the first year to happen? What does it look like? They shouldn't have to look at the whole big picture because it will frustrate teachers and it will frustrate uh, students. Um, you have to support these teachers because they're going to be moving from a traditional instructional model to becoming a facilitator. That's not easy to do. Probably that's the biggest challenge of this whole piece. Um, and you have to allow students to rise to the challenge. You know, the one thing I've learned about simulated workplace is we, evidently we put our finger on kids, our thumbs, and kept them down. You let the finger up and let these kids take the lead, I am, I am amazed at what they are accomplishing in this last year that we saw. And then you have to have, of course, the partners with the employers because they will affect the change. This isn't for education. This is for business and industry, and it's a much deeper relationship at workplace than we ever had through just meeting or just doing business meetings. So where are we now in West Virginia? We are three, this next year will be our third year in. Um, what our vision is, what I said was we just scratched the surface. Our big, big vision is that all of our career tech centers will become corporations. And every company within that will be part of the corporation. And the CEOs or the job foreman or whatever the head student our position is, would meet with the CTE directors to talk about how do we improve our companies, what are the issues, if, if they come to a meeting and they look down, they see that the attendance issue in the welding company is far below the other companies, the students, along with the director of the center, will discuss strategies to improve attendance. They have a voice in their education. Um, and the other is that with this next year, we're going to be sending out quarterly, I'm sorry, semi-annual reports to these companies to show students what their company has earned based on qualities of their attendance, their drug testing, their skill sets they've earned, their test scores, so their company starts getting a monetary value. But we have had so many wonderful ideas come out of this simulated workplace from students. Some students wanted paychecks. So I have some companies that, that give paychecks to their students. Uh, they have a payroll department in their company, and their paycheck is based on how many skill sets they've learned. Of course, it's virtual dollars. It's not true monetary dollars. But they can spend these dollars, you know, on other things that these schools have come up with. It's, it's just been an unbelievable two years, and what we're seeing changing with students and the enthusiasm, and also the instructors, even my instructors who have given me a pushback on, on this situation are starting to turn, and some of my uh, biggest naysayers are now my biggest proponents. So that's basically what simulated workplace is, and it's changing the culture, changing the environment so that students actually are experiencing and learning about business processes in their um, career technical education classroom. Thank you. Kathy, this is Kimberly. Uh, before we get into the questions, our Q&A session, I just wanted to see if the other presenters on the line wanted to share a quick lesson learned from their perspective. Yes, Kimberly, this is Fan. I'd like to say something. You know, Dr. D'Antoni says that this is, you know, it's not easy. But as a secondary education director, I want to say that this is the easiest initiative that I had to roll out. You know, and I rolled out in, in almost my 30 years, I rolled out Common Core, No Child Left Behind, and those were difficult. 
if this is relatively easy, and the reason why this was easy is, is I think we're doing right by kids through a simulated workplace. Yeah. We're empowering them for leadership roles. For instance, students rotate through a variety of, of, of jobs. Some are foremen, some are safety directors, some are quality assurance people. And so there's relevance for them to simulate a workplace. Another reason why it was so easy is because we went slow that first year to implement simulated workplace. Um, you know, when we provide the professional development for our instructors, uh, we, did, we did not want to overwhelm the instructor. The instructors had the capability to customize each company and to make it effective. Our students at our center can tell what value they are to their company daily, weekly, quarterly, and by the end of the year. And all that becomes part of their portfolio process. So when students feel empowered, it's really a win-win situation for students and industry officials. I know. <laughs> Some days I go without ever having anybody having Great, thank you, Jan. Uh, Gary, Doug, do you have any lessons learned? Uh, sure, this is Doug. I'll just go real quick. Probably the biggest uh, thing from an instructor standpoint is making that transition from a traditional teacher to a facilitator. Um, as an instructor, we have to learn to give up control, and that's one of the, the most difficult things uh, to do. You know, we have the book with the answers in it, and uh, to turn that over to the students and allow them to run with it is a difficult transition. So part of um, the work that we're doing now is going back in and offering professional development uh, to begin to teach instructors how to become facilitators, to allow these students to go through and uh, work their way through the processes themselves without having to have all the answers. So that, that's probably the biggest change for me as an instructor, uh, was changing that classroom to where uh, it, I became the facilitator of it instead of a, a talking head. Great. Thank you. And again, uh, those of you not speaking, please mute your phone. We're getting a little bit of background noise. Thank you. This is Gary, and I'd like to talk from the business perspective. The big thing that we've learned here now, too, is how important this partnership between employers and schools is going to be going forward. Uh, the changes in business are changing. Things aren't changing every year. They're changing every three months. And for the simulated workplace to work, uh, these changes are going to have to take place on a regular basis, or students aren't going to have the right skill sets coming out of here. So. The, the only thing that, get, that, that uh, can happen is, is a very close partnership. You know, employers say that their their most important asset are their employees. And if you were having problems with the raw materials, you'd go out and correct those issues. That's what we're looking to happen here. And important is going to be the local programs. Uh, it's great for Dr. D'Antoni and I to be joined at the hip at the state level, and that's got these programs going. But the key success is going to come with those local partnerships with your local employers at your local school defining what the requirements are, because a lot of these kids are wanting to stay in their area for their jobs. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Gary. And Andrea, do you want to lead us through our questions and answers session? Absolutely. So we've got about 13 minutes to um, try and cover all of your great questions that we're getting. And actually, Gary and Kathy, this first question is to you, and we're going to segue from your talk about getting businesses involved. And so um, if you could talk concretely about how did you get uh, you know, the, the business is involved, you know, was there an MOU, et cetera? How did that functionally work? Um, well, to begin with, I visited or contacted all the uh, associations, state associations, manufacturing business, coal mining association, uh, oil and gas association. I made uh, the Chamber of Commerce. So. Then I ended up after the first, first of all, we tried it that way. It was difficult. We had some business like Gary, for example, who was immediately uh, willing to help. But we had a lot of small businesses in West Virginia. There were one or two people, and they had a difficult time giving up their time. So we, uh, I finally uh, 
contracted with a person outside of, and they went out and uh, they uh, worked with business and industry for a while. That They still didn't have all the people we needed. So the next thing we did was we partnered with the workforce investment boards that are across the state of West Virginia. They helped us find employers that would go in and become business inspections. That was a huge help. This coming year, um, the National Guard that has all the expertise in these various areas um, and are also work for folks have agreed to part with us. So, so that's, that's basically how it all started. Gary, you want to add anything to that? Sure. I, I can talk specifically about the Manufacturers Association that, that Kathy knows. Like I said, we, we started first at the state level, sitting down talking with Kathy and talk about the programs. But now we, we've gone, and it's, it's really a, the emphasis is on our association to get our members involved. Kathy and I have both promised if I have a school that's not working with our members, I'll call her. And if she has companies that aren't working with the school, she's going to call me, and we're, we're going to stress and get those folks in there. Uh, I think the big thing to do is, is there's a little bit of a sell that has to go on maybe with some of the smaller local employers, but it is critical for them. They're all telling us they can't find employees. If you can't find employees, you've got to be going to the school, to, to the source. These are the lifeblood and the future of your company are these employees, and they need to be involved to be able to do these things. So it's not a matter of them doing you a favor. It's something that's important to their business for them to be there. So that's the approach we've taken. And uh, Kathy and Gary, uh, specifically for you know the extremely rural areas of West Virginia, did you have to do anything special there, or were folks you know lining up ready to to help out? Uh, no, we well West Virginia is extremely rural. <laughs> I think the whole state's extremely rural, but in our very very rural areas. Um, that's where we have engaged the National Guard. That's where we're looking at the various workforce investment boards to help us in, the, in those particular areas. Um, you're, you know, that, that's how we're trying to do it. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so now a, a question to you, Kathy. Um, you know, we did get a question about, did you look to other states for, um, you know, models or initiatives? Um, and second to that, were there major infrastructure changes that you needed to do to implement this? Um, no. We, we, uh, we sort of did this uh, based on conversations that we had with business and industry and just through all those conversations figured out or thought we figured out what the problem was, why employers couldn't find uh, the employees and what they were telling us it was it was the soft skills. It wasn't the technical skills. So change the infrastructure? Not really. We we reorganized the way we delivered. We we changed the environment, but simulated work doesn't require a major dollars, and it doesn't require it requires a change in attitude and a change in environment. And uh, and sometimes change in the culture and. It, by working and acting and promoting as companies, it changes the dynamic, and students really get into it. They for some they let they have uniforms. That's part of it. They have uh, they clock in and clock out. They have reports that are due. The, the instructor they do it right. It's less work on the instructor because the students are responsible for all the workings of this company. It's it's amazing to watch. Mm -hmm. So this is where we're going to segue a little bit into some Perkins questions because we've got a lot of our um, uh, state folks on the line. And so, um, as, as you said, you reorganized some of your state funding, um, you know, to be able to better accommodate the simulated workplaces. Did you also do that with your Perkins money? Well, Perkins money we have to send out per FTE. So. Uh, I really don't have that much. We don't get that much Perkins compared to other states. West Virginia is a very small state. Those dollars pretty much um, go by what the rules are with Perkins. Where we tried to help is with our state funding, our vocational funding. Um, we reorganized that. 
So the Perkins pretty much stays with its um, priorities the way it is. And so now, as you know, with Perkins, there's different indicators about like technical skills assessments, et cetera. Right. So we got a question here about do you use industry-recognized certifications in the portfolio yes. to demonstrate that TSA and how? Yes. We do industry-recognized certifications. We are setting money aside of our state dollars next year to pay for industry-recognized cert for students who cannot pay. Um, all of our programs have a if it is there, they are required to have an industry recognized certification with that program. And we pay for that student's, student's ability to get that certification. Um, so the answer to that technical assessments, we have portfolios and capstone. That's all part of the company's requirement. So a student um, to demonstrate their technical skill attainment, every Completer has a portfolio that they present to business and industry and a capstone that they have done to culminate to show us what they have completed in their program. And that's all presented to business and industry. Okay, and uh, this just to make sure that I, I don't know if you answered this part of the question, but uh, there was a second question about um, does the state determine the certifications that are valued by business and industry? You know, what's that process? Now, business and industry, uh, we have asked, we have had focus groups, we reach out to the various employers to see which certifications that they think are important for, for us here. Uh, we also do NCCER, which is a, a um, certifications that go across state lines. So we look at certifications that industry, business and industry are telling us that they want. Okay. Um, and and to Gary, this is Gary, I would also say that part of the audit process that takes place where the businesses come in, if things are changing and new certificates are coming out, we should start to hear some of those out of there. Or again, Kathy and, and I at the state level, we'd be identifying some of those things that are changing. So again, business needs to be involved so those certificates evolve with the workplace. All right, um, one last question um, that, that we got here was about the role of post-secondary education in the simulated workplace, you know, um, dual concurrent enrollment, et cetera. Um, we have um, what we call an EDGE program where students going through our programs have opportunities to earn free, free college credit with the, uh, a, a program that's aligned with them at the post-secondary level. Um, that is in our state law and students, um, that, that's also with our consortium. So yes, post-secondary is a piece of this um, through our career pathways. All right. Um, well, with that, I think we're kind of um, running out of time. Uh, so if there's any additional questions, please throw them into that chat box and we will um, uh, certainly make sure to follow up and answer any other questions that you do have. So with that, Kimberly, I'll hand it back to you. Great. Thank you. <laughs> and again, I want to thank everyone for attending the webinar. Uh, special thanks to our presenters and uh, Kathy and the great team that she pulled together with the work happening in West Virginia. Uh, as we said in the beginning, and you know we have it on the screen as well, and you will get a follow-up email that will show where the PowerPoint and the webinar and the recording are archived. There's two different sites. We'll also make sure to include information for where you can learn more about the simulated workplace. We also said early on that this is the first in a series of CTE webinars that we will be putting together, so we will definitely put you on the list for the other three as they come up in the near future. And we'd like to ask you to help us improve our work by completing the short evaluation survey that's going to up up on the screen uh, in a minute. So please thank you for doing that. And again, as Andrea said, if you have any other questions, make sure you get them in the chat feature and we will answer those. So if nothing else, um, thank you again for your time. Thank you again to the presenters. And we look forward to having a conversation with you again soon.